Hello, everyone, and welcome to this program on whistleblowing. We are going to address the content of EU Whistleblowing Directive 2019-1937 from 23rd October 2019. The intention is to address it from a board member's perspective. This program is a part of a series of educational videos developed by ECODA. This specific video is done in partnership with the Diligent. I'm Henry Jan, CISO at the Diligent, and I'm together with Florence and Michelle uh, to join me as the part of the panel. Without waiting too long, let me jump into the first question. I will address it to you, Florence. Florence, by end of last year, every European member state should have transposed the EU whistleblowing directive into national law. Could you elaborate on which companies are concerned by the directive? What is the scope of the reporting? So thank you, Henry. Uh, so I'm Florence Apostolou. I'm a qualified lawyer in Luxembourg. I'm a partner at Alvinger Os Prussen, a Luxembourg law firm. So thank you for the question. Uh, first, let me clarify the aim of the EU directive. So over the past decade, it has become increasingly apparent that whistleblowers play a key role in exposing and preventing breaches of EU law and thereby safeguarding public welfare. So the aim of the directive is to enhance whistleblower protection by introducing effective, confidential and secure reporting channels. Even though the directive has not yet been implemented in every EU member state, it still applies given that it has a vertical direct effect and any citizen may invoke their rights under the directive against the member state that failed to implement the directive on time. So the directive applies to all entities with 250 workers or more. Smaller entities with at least 50 workers have an additional two year period to comply. Small companies with fewer than 50 workers are in principle exempted from this obligation with the exception though of companies operating in the field of financial services or vulnerable to anti-money laundering or counter-terrorist financing due to the high risk arising from the activities of such companies. Indeed, uh, whistleblowers have played a key role in revealing serious breaches of the public interest. I think a couple of examples we can think of, I can think of is uh, Edward S uh, Snowden. Certainly that was a major whistleblower case here. In fact, and not just the, here in the U US as well as the part of the entire EU and the rest of the, uh, the world. Uh, another more local uh, whistleblowing example I can relate to why I was working for a financial service company uh, is a gentleman named Harry uh, Marco Polos, who uh, did approach SEC on numerous oca occasion uh, regarding uh, Bernard Madoff uh, Ponzi scheme. Uh, so this is the, I think, uh, certainly whistleblow uh, had a, a huge impact to, to, the, you know, to the result, whether it's financial service industry or national security. So to that end, um, as a result, the, their protection become a hot topic at a European uh, political level. Uh, but this is a question to you, Florence. Um, but who is a whistleblower under the directive and what are the applicable protection? Thank you, Henry. Um, so indeed, who is a whistleblower? So a whistleblower is a person who acquired information regarding a breach of EU law in a work-related context and who intends to report it. So this could cover, for instance, current and former employees, including volunteers and trainees, could also cover uh, self-employed persons, um, sub uh, subcontractors, suppliers, and their own employees, but also shareholders and members of management of the company. So what breaches the whistleblower may report in order to benefit from the protection? This is another good question. So under the directive, the whistleblower uh, the whistleblower protection covers any reporting of wrongdoing related to EU law. 
could be, for instance, tax fraud, money laundering, or offenses related, relating to public procurement, product or transport safety, environmental protection, public health and consumer, or even data protection. EU law encourages national legislators to extend the scope of the directive in their respective national laws so that the breaches that may be reported will not only be limited to EU law, but also concern widely additional local laws. What are the conditions for granting whistleblower protection? To benefit from the protection of the directive, the report shall concern a breach of EU law or even other local laws in the member state if the member state has chosen to extend the scope of the directive while implementing it. So the whistleblower must have reasonable grounds to believe that the reported information is true at the time of the reporting. And this, this is obviously to avoid imaginary breaches. And finally, the, the whistleblower must use the proper reporting channels. How are whistleblowers protection protected? Whistleblowers are protected against any form of retaliation. For instance, it could be intimidation, discrimination action, demotion, dismissal, and so on. It is to be noted that the burden of proof will be on the employer to demonstrate that they did not act in retaliation following a report. In the event of retaliation, remedies may be granted to the whistleblower. Each country shall also set up independent bodies responsible for assisting and advising whistleblowers. Uh, Florence, that was a great uh, context you uh, outlined previously. Uh, you did mention that uh, you know, the company need a proper reporting channels. Uh, can you elaborate on the company's you know, obligations uh, pursued to the EU directive? Well, for example, training, awareness, how do the report specifically, um, please? To comply with the directive, companies are required to create internal communication channels for handling whistleblower reports, ensuring confidentiality and protect their identity. In addition to the creation of proper reporting channels, companies must also provide training to raise awareness on all the issues around whistleblowing, so as to foster a climate of trust within the workplace. Companies may certainly gain from being proactive and take preventive measures. Having a workforce that is trained in these topics could reduce the risk to face a public leak. It may also contribute to create an attractive workplace and benefit the company's reputation. Great, thank you, Florence, for the, for the answers here. Hi, Henry. Hello to all. I'm glad to be with you and Florence on this panel. I currently chair the policy committee of ECODA, the European Confederation of Directors Associations. I have been a board member on various listed and non-listed companies, and my executive career was in an international oil and gas company. Florence, by the way, once a report has been done, what's next? What actions are to be taken in the context of a report? And what are the follow-up actions? What is the feedback? Thank you for advising us. Well, upon receipt of a report, the person or department in charge with the company must first acknowledge receipt of the report. Such person shall then follow up diligently on the report, proceed to internal investigations, and provide feedback to the reporting person within a reasonable time period. Under the directive, the reasonable time frame should not exceed three months. In the absence of feedback or appropriate follow-up within the legal time frame, the whistleblower can contact the competent external independent body, which will take over the relevant investigations based on the report. Again, if, the, if after a reasonable period of time, not exceeding three or six months, depending on the case, the independent body has not provided the whistleblower with its feedback or did not 
proceed to an appropriate follow-up, then the whistleblower can disclose the information to the public, including to the media. Of course, records of every report must be kept in compliance with the confidentiality required. Hey, Michelle, um, explain to us how board members will be impacted by the whistleblowing directive. Uh, can you provide you know, concrete examples how board members are organizing themselves? And uh, for example, what kind of uh, internal reporting channels have they put in place? Well, in the past, it was mostly about harassment, favoritism and bribes denounced through calls, messages, and even the press. Now, it covers all topics like cheated false accounts, HSE, spying, and the reputation of a company can be immediately damaged through social media channels. The time horizon has changed. Therefore, the board must ensure that an effective whistleblowing mechanism is in place within the company, most of the time in the form of a hotline that can be used by employees, either by phone or emails and under the management of an independent person, very important point, not a board member, and possibly external to the company. As experience shows, if some alerts can be purely personal or private and would not affect the company, it is nevertheless imperative to examine all alerts received in order not to miss a potentially serious information. Ultimately, boards and the committees in charge of the governance or CSR need to be informed in real time by the management of any whistleblower alerts, procedures, and of the follow-up actions and possible sanctions to be taken. In fact, Boards need to be on a permanent alert on such issues. I would even say day and night. Now, Henry, let me turn to you. As an expert in cybersecurity, could you please tell us if there are any regulations that require cyber-related matters to be reported via the same whistleblower process? With cybersecurity risks becoming one of the most prominent risks for companies, are those risks related to whistleblower programs? If so, how does it work? Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Michelle, for the great question. Uh, so in the US, I can only speak from, it, from the knowledge based on the, the you know, obviously geographically in the US. Uh, I'm not aware there's any federal statutes that are specifically designated for uh, cybersecurity related uh, whistleblower protection. I think the history with the US, the, you know, the federal law are often uh, old and outdated and extremely difficult to, um, uh, to pass. Uh, in addition to that, you know, 50 states might have a different regulations uh, in, in this case, uh, certainly for privacies. So because of that, um, in absence of very specific regulation from a federal level, however, there are some existing federal and state laws that provide protection to workers to report cybersecurity matters. Uh, specifically, uh, SOX, SOX, the Sarban Oxley Act, and uh, False Claim Act, FCA, uh, as well as the state wrongful discharge laws. Uh, those uh, regulations are certainly provide adequate protection for any person who shall report uh, matters through whistleblower channel. Uh, to your second part of the question, Michelle, uh, as a cyber risk are being recognized as a part of the business risk under uh, company's ERM, Enterprise Risk Management Program, unmitigated cyber risk should be reported via internal uh, reporting structure, as well as uh, being reported to, you know, through the company's formal whistleblower program especially with the risk are material to companies, you know, internal program that fail to meet the due care and due diligence cadence. Henry, would you have any recommendations on how board or executive management team should be prepared to handle the fallout from the whistleblower program? 
Michelle, thank you. That's also a great question, which we often uh, see, right, you know, uh, or judge the uh, instant response from how company responded instant, you know, because instant, whether it's whistleblower or report internally, externally, will happen. Uh, certainly, organizations should uh, develop procedures and a playbook in advance uh, to respond to the fallout from a whistleblower program. Uh, this plan can leverage existing instant response procedure, uh, often used by crisis management team uh, that's involving you know, legal, uh, public relations department. Sometimes marketing is fulfilling that role for small organization, as well as a subject matter experts. The subject matter expert in this case, certainly the, you know, the legal, the internal legal, external legal, um, retainer services, outside of a PR firm should be all part of that resource helping dealing with the fallout risk or um, you blowout know, uh, issue. To mitigate potential reputation, reputational damage, um, again, engaging external uh, legal retainer service uh, in, in addition to your legal team also provides tremendous value. Uh, some of the cyber insurance uh, also covers uh, such incident as well. So this is something that organizations should be thinking of. Michelle, uh, do you think there is a need at the board level for an ethics committee? Well, ethics committees composed of representatives from the board and management can indeed be settled to address ethical and whistleblowing issues. However, ethics should not be circumscribed to one committee. It is even quite the opposite, I think. Ethics must be covered at board level because the company's reputation can be threatened. But as any other important topic, it can indeed be followed and prepared by a committee on behalf of the board. Well, this being said, I do not think that having a multiplicity of specific committees helps because it tends to slice, to specialize the examination of a topic which by essence is transversal. Corporate governance, risks, ESG committees can very well be combined and appropriately deal with ethics, which is a transversal issue. I have a follow-up question clearly here for Florence. Um, do you see any potential topics gaining attention from whistleblowers in the near future? Well, uh, many topics have already been put forward in the past and will most likely remain in the spotlight. I can think of three broad categories. The first uh, relates to social topics and includes issues such as gender equality, discrimination, health and safety. The second relates to environmental topics and the third one concerns governance and ethical aspects such as tax evasion, fraud, and so on. Uh, thank you for, for the answer in that. From, from a cybersecurity point of view, something happening in the future. Uh, here in the US, I'm, uh, I'm actively aware that uh, as a result of the solo wing attack in late 2020, which is a part of a supply chain issue, a huge issue affecting many organizations from Microsoft, Cisco to financial service company, um, there are some uh, cybersecurity experts call for 117th uh, Congress should promptly enact a robust protection for cyber uh, whistleblowers. So it's ask, right? It's, it's a wish for thinking, some of might say, uh, but we are hopeful. So uh, that's something where we are, you know, as a cyber practitioner, I'm definitely, you know, stand very strong behind that message. Uh, but in addition to the very specific cyber call out for whistleblower uh, program or process, uh, Consumer Online Privacy Right Act, short as a COBRA, uh, COBRA is a privacy law that at work that will also give it whistleblower protections in addition to right, the other regulations I mentioned in the past. Now, before we close the session, Florence, Henry, can you give me one word, one expression, one sentence to summarize your advice, your opinion, your suggestion to board members? Please. I would say prevention is better than cure. So in other words, proactiveness. I would say from, from a cyber uh, or extended uh, risk management practice is really, we need to demonstrate the due care and due diligence. And we don't say this lightly. We have to both demonstrate 
you know, the due care, which means knowing what needs to be happen and providing the means, and the due diligence is the you know uh, the actually material change to uh, to improve the cyber program. So I'm thinking, I think the board uh, and everyone else should really thinking about this from uh, you know to be involved a, as much as they can. I have noted in your words prevention, proactiveness, due diligence. For my part, I would say stay on alert day and night if necessary. Now it's time to conclude and to thank Florence from Eldinger Haas Prusen for her precious contribution. And indeed, Henry from Diligent for the organization with ECODA of this lively discussion on whistleblowing. Whistleblowing, just another priority for board members in 2022.